Hello, I'm Dr. Robin Gosher, and this video will be about the basics of spectroscopy. Over the course of the video, what you'll learn is that spectroscopy is all about three things, energy and photons and electrons. So the, how the energy of photons interacts with the energy levels of electrons. Before we go any further, it's really important that you understand some basics of light and energy. Light behaves both like a wave and a particle. They call this particle wave duality. As a wave, light is electromagnetic radiation. And so you can see in the bottom left here that you have waves both in an electric field and a magnetic field. And these are perpendicular from each other at a 90 degree angle. So the electric field is in the plane of your screen. And the magnetic field is in the plane coming in and out of your screen. As a wave, we have a couple of characteristics for waves, the wavelength. And so your wavelength, of course, is going from one peak to the next peak, or from one trough to the next trough. And wavelength is measured in meters. There's also frequency, and that's how many waves will pass by a given point per second. And the units, therefore, are one per second, or hertz. If you multiply the frequency times the wavelength, you'll get C, the speed of light, which is written on the right-hand side. As a particle, we have the particle of light, which is the photon. And what a photon is, it's not really a thing that you can like handle, like a particle of a rock or anything like that. It's a discrete, right? So distinct packet of energy. And the energy of that E is going to be equal to Planck's constant, which is written right there, times the frequency. We can take those two formulas the speed of light equals frequency times wavelength up on top, and energy equals Planck's top constant times frequency. And what they have in common is frequency. And so what you can do is rearrange that top equation to solve for frequency. Okay, so we get frequency equals the speed of light over wavelength. And then you can plug that in where frequency appears in the energy equation. And if you substitute that, you get that the energy of a photon equals Planck's constant times the speed of light, C, divided by wavelength. And so from this, what's really important to take away, other than memorizing these simple equations and understanding how to use them, is that energy of this photon is directly proportional to frequency. So the proportion, of course, is Planck's constant. It's directly proportional to frequency, whereas energy is indirectly or inversely proportional to wavelength. So it's proportional to one over wavelength. And that's a pretty hideous proportion sign. So let me go ahead and draw that better for you. Proportional. The electromagnetic spectrum, which you've probably seen before, covers a huge range of frequencies and wavelengths. On the right hand side of the screen, you have long radio waves. And those are going to be things that really have incredibly long wavelengths. So you can see on the bottom here, the wavelength in meters is something like 10 to the 8 meters. And those aren't particularly useful analytically. And as you go from the left, of course, you're going through the microwave to the IR, and then you get to the physical spectrum, which is such a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, but it's where we humans see. And if you go further left to higher frequency, remember, increased frequency means increased energy, then you'll get all the way to x-rays and gamma rays. So there's a couple of really important things to understand about this electromagnetic radiation. At this point, the first one is that if you're talking about visible light, and you're talking about spectroscopy with visible light, then it's sometimes called colorimetry because you're talking about colors of light and colors of samples. The other thing to realize is that when we refer to light in spectroscopy, we're usually talking about light of a particular wavelength and that lambda in Greek letter is our abbreviation for wavelength. The reason why we use this is that the units of wavelength for visible light and UV and IR, which is what we use most often, those are more convenient units. Um, it's pretty easy to take this 10 to the minus 7 meters that visible light is and convert that into nanometers, where a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. Frequency, on the other hand, we're talking 10 to the 15th per second. It's an incredible number, and it's kind of awkward to deal with. Energy is also equally awkward. Okay, spectroscopy. 
There are two basic types of spectroscopy, absorption and emission. And it's easier if we start talking about this in terms of the energy levels of atoms. You know from general chemistry that the electrons in an atom are going to fill orbitals. And these orbitals are things like the 1s, 2s, 2p orbitals. The ground state where all of those electrons are filled into the orbitals in the lowest energies they can be, that ground state is at a lower energy than the excited states. So if we're talking about energy as your y-axis here, then the ground state is down at the bottom, and you have a number of different excited states up here. Okay. When a photon comes in, and that's the squiggly red line here, with a particular energy of HV, what it can do is excite the electron, and that's our gorgeous little blue ball there, and it can excite that electron from the ground state up into the excited state, and that's termed absorption. This will happen if the change in energy between those two states is the same as the frequency times Planck's constant of that photon, aka if the energy between ground and excited states for your atom matches the energy of the photon. Now once it's up there, it's possible for you to also have that electron relax back down to the ground state through the emission of that energy as another photon. So it needs to give up the energy it gained. And the distance in the energy scale there, that delta E, then is going to be the energy of the photon that is emitted. Because different atoms have different delta E's, you then have specific energies of photons, specific wavelengths of photons, that can be absorbed and or emitted. The spectrum is simply a plot of the light absorbed or emitted. It could be either one. In this case, we have an absorbance spectrum. And so absorbance here is our y-axis. And that's as a function of wavelength. It could be as a function of energy or frequency as well. But like I mentioned before, wavelength is most convenient. Because of the fact that we have very particular energy levels for different atoms, you can see here that for atomic spectroscopy, the absorbance spectrum of sodium atoms has these very sharp, distinct lines. And so those correspond to transitions from, say, the 3s to 3p orbitals. And those are two lines around 589 nanometers there. Atomic spectra are unique. Here's a small example. Um, and each of the lines here corresponds to what the emission or absorbance lines are. They're the same because it's the same energy gap for several different atoms. And there's that big doublet that we just saw that was so bright for sodium, okay? And so the moral of this story is that every element has a unique set of wavelengths where it will absorb or emit, and that's due to the unique energy changes between the orbital energy levels. The types of experiments that you can do with atomic absorption or emission are really quite varied, but they boil down to three different things. Because it's atomic absorbance or emission, you have to have your sample atomized. And so the heart of this is this nice warm flame right here. So there's other ways to atomize it. For now, let's just say there's a flame. In your emission experiment, the heat of the flame is going to cause that sample, the atoms in that sample to be excited. And then when they relax back down, that emission signal is going to be released. And then you can choose a particular wavelength and detect how much light came out. And so that emission is going to be diagrammatically shown right here. It's the heat that gets the atoms into that excited state, and then they release light, emission of light, when they relax back down. OK, for absorption, now what you have to think about is that you have some sort of lamp. In this case, it's a hollow cathode lamp. It's a particular type. And so that light comes in. You can see it squiggling in here. That will excite um, your atoms into those excited states. And now you can again select for wavelength using a monochromator and figure out, oh my gosh, there's a loss of light transmitted because these atoms were absorbing it. They took that energy. And then finally, fluorescence is a combination of the two. We haven't talked about that just yet. But in this case, you still have incident light. In this case, it's brighter light from a laser. 
and that'll still cause the excitation. So absorbance is your first step in fluorescence. So light ends up causing absorbance that excites your atom. And so there's your light coming in. There's your atom being excited. And then when that atom relaxes back down, it will emit light again. And so on these diagrams, all of the blue lines, originally blue lines, are processes where light is emitted. And the black lines are ones that are um, light coming from a different light source. Okay, so that was atomic spectroscopy. Now we're going to transition over to molecular spectroscopy. And so first we have to talk about molecular energy levels. It's the same basic principles of having ground and excited state energy levels and looking at the energy differences between those. But of course, molecules have bonds and this turns out to be really important to how the spectra look. So before we get into the details of how the spectra look, let's first talk about bonds. So the sigma bonds are bonds between two different s orbitals. So here's the s orbitals of two atoms and those little dots in the middle are the nuclei and it looks kind of like a pair of eyeballs. Now orbitals can have a polarity. Um, it's kind of an arbitrary thing, quantum mechanics and all that stuff, positive or negative. If they have the same polarity when you bring these two atoms together, then what will occur is you have your two nuclei and a bonding s orbital will include a large shared cloud for those atoms. It looks something like that. You could also have those orbitals um, for the two different atoms, but they could have different polarities, and that'll be shown just by shading this one here. And so if you bring those two atoms closer together, they're not going to want to interact because they have opposite polarities. And you kind of get this repulsion of the two s orbitals from each other. It looks like a cross-eyed face. Okay. And that's going to be your anti-bonding orbital. Bonding orbitals are always gonna be at lower energy states. And so it turns out that I actually drew this such that the Y dimension of the slide is energy. Now, what if you have pi orbitals? Um, pi orbitals are gonna come from, or sorry, pi bonds are going to come from P orbitals. And so that's our dumbbell shaped things. Again, the little dot in the middle is like a nucleus. And with P orbitals, you have lobes as well that have some sort of polarity. And if they're the same, then when you bring these two nuclei together, what's going to happen is those top two will end up interacting and those bottom two will end up interacting. And so that's kind of drawn as these two kind of hamburger bun things going on here, right? So you formed that bond where this space in the middle has ended up becoming shared. And as you can imagine, you can also have an anti-bonding pi orbital between these, and that's when your lobes have opposite polarities. Okay. And so if you bring those together, the two nuclei are brought together, then they're going to kind of repel each other again. Apologies for my kind of crappy drawing. And that is your pi star anti-bonding orbital between p orbitals. Now, of course, molecules, this is like one bond. As an example, molecules have many more bonds. And so we talk about molecular orbitals and they can get really complex. Now you just have ozone and there's three different P e orbitals, but you still have this idea of a bonding orbital where everything is shared. You can have non-bonding orbitals as well. It's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but there's a node here um, so that middle oxygen isn't involved. And then you have anti-bonding where, again, you've got the biggest number of nodes and, and all of that. And so what's going on is that you have, again, this notation of pi star and pi. Okay. The star always designates an anti-bonding orbital. And you can see here the electron filling with the purple electrons. And so what I want to do right now is just refresh your memory of two terminology points. With molecular orbitals, we have the HOMO, which is the highest occupied molecular orbital. And so that's this one, highest energy. Note that there's an energy over here. And then you have LUMO, which is your lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And so it's the difference in energy between these two things 
that delta E that is going to matter for molecular spectroscopy. Absorbance will occur if the delta E between that homo and lumo happens to coincide with HB, the energy of the photon that's coming in. All right, so the energy of the photon that comes in. Well, how do we know if that's useful to us? We should talk for a moment about chromophores. Chromophores are the part of the molecule that's responsible for absorbing the light. And the table here on the bottom left talks about different transitions, and you'll recognize some of them. We have the sigma to sigma star transition right here, and we have pi to pi star. And n in this table represents non-bonding. You just saw that a moment ago in the molecular orbitals. So what's their trend? Well, here's the thing. Things that involve sigma star or sigma um, tend to be in the UV. And you know sigma is a single bond. It's between the s orbitals, and so you have all these examples here of single bonds. Because those absorb in the UV, they're going to be colorless in the visible. That's why water is clear. Okay, that's cool. Um, things that are then going to absorb in the visible range that's helpful to us are things that involve this pi star orbital. Pi stars are great for us. And those are unsaturated bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, whatever it might be that they're bonded to. And if you ever look at the structure of dyes, like food coloring, Allura Red, Red 40, um, off on the right here, has a ton of double bonds. It's got the aromatic rings, and there are these sulfonate groups. It turns out the anions help as a chromophore as well. So those absorb light really well. And of course, that's a red dye. So what if you care about something that doesn't have a double bond? Hey, this happens a lot. I'm sorry. I particularly am really interested in analyzing sugars. Guess what? Sugars, like glucose here, only have single bonds. Well, unless I want to go and measure in the UV, and I mean like far UV, where like air absorbs it, because nitrogen and air also has single bonds. Isn't that fun? Then I have to do something else. And so what we do is we react it with a chromophore. If you can do chemistry on this, you can react your analyte with something that does absorb light. And once they're bound to each other, the whole complex will absorb light. During that reaction, you need to make sure if you're trying to quantify things, that your analyte is the limiting reagent and you have excess chromophore. That way, whatever you produce as your product has all of your analyte possible. So to measure glucose, one way is to use DNS. And that has this beautiful aromatic ring in the middle. I'm gonna turn that aromatic ring into a smiley face because it's our chromophore with those double bonds. And it turns out that DNS, dinitrosalicylic acid, has these nitro groups that are yellow when it's all on its own. And then what it'll do is react under basic conditions with the reducing end of glucose. And so the glucose is gonna change here to here. And that ends up taking your nitrate and converting it into an amine. And that amine, because it's different things, um, different molecule now, changes energy levels, and that shifts the color of the DNS. And so if you get more of this orange-brown color, you know that you had sugar or some other reducing end molecule present. Okay? There are other ones. So in this case, we actually have a separate reaction that's changing the color of the chromophore. There are other ones where the chromophore gets bonded to and stays onto the analyte. Okay. If you go and you take a molecular absorbance spectrum, you're gonna find it looks something like the one on the right. The peaks are really broad. They're not sharp. They're not tiny little spikes of lines like the atomic spectra. Um, here's cranberry juice for you. Why is that? Huh. Well, all of the energy level diagrams that I've shown you so far have been really simplistic. We've just had ground state and excited state. What actually happens is that because molecules have bonds, you have many additional energy levels from bond vibration. And so you have these vibrational energy levels right here. And that is our kind of thick lines. And so this one very much on the bottom is the ground vibrational of the ground electronic state. And then the other kind of thick lines are your excited vibrational states within your ground state down here. Okay. And then the other thing is, of course, that molecules can rotate and tumble over each other. 
And if they're doing that, if they're spinning, then they're changing energy. And so you could even these smaller energy level differences, and those are the thinnest lines on here. Now, what that means for absorbance is now that if you have um, some light coming in, you're a photon, you can go from the very, very ground level to each one of these particular things. And now you're imagining, wow, that's a huge range of energies. I should probably be switching colors because the energy is changing, but hey, I don't want to waste the time. That's a huge range of energies. And of course, they could also start from any other place in here. And what that does is because huge range of energies, it blurs the number of wavelengths, and you get these big fat peaks in molecular absorbance, which is not the case for atoms. You can explore this a little bit more by playing with a particular molecule. This is our molecule here, and looking at it under different conditions. Um, I really want to just point out the two extremes of this figure. The first one is the one that looks like what you saw before, and that's spectrum four. And that's the spectrum in water at room temperature. The solvent and the temperature have really caused this molecule to tumble a lot, to rotate, to vibrate. It's transferring a lot of energy. Now, if what you do is to switch over to gas phase where there's no solvent effects, then you have a lot of these really sharp peaks and those correspond to those fine differences in energy from vibration. Okay, now that you understand that there are these things called vibrational energy levels, it's time to just do a quick overview of other spectroscopy types. What we've talked about so far has been all in the realm of UV vis absorbance and emission spectroscopy. And on the diagram on the left here, that's represented by the blue arrows going from a ground electronic state to an excited electronic state. And of course, our smaller lines with the little Vs next to them are different vibrational energy levels within those. What we also have is infrared spectroscopy. And infrared spectroscopy only has enough light, or <laughs> infrared light only has enough energy to excite between these vibrational energy levels. So if we return to the overall electromagnetic spectrum, where, although it's a different figure than before, you have the radio waves on the right-hand side, and you have your gamma rays on the left with higher energy. We can do a lot of spectroscopy in here. A topic for another time is the use of nuclear magnetic resonance with radio waves to study the spin of nuclei. Your microwave at home is going to rotate molecules, which is an even smaller energy level than the vibrations over here. Because remember, you've got all these different things in here. And so microwaves are like, eh, right there, OK? Um, that's going to be low energy, more than radio, but not as much as infrared. We have the IR spectroscopy that I just mentioned. There's ours at Niagara. We have these molecular orbitals that you should recognize now, where we've got a bonding pi orbital here. And you've got an anti-bonding pi star orbital there. And you're getting an electron excited from one to the other. That occurs within the UV invisible. Now, the other thing that's really worth talking about is the fact that as you go to even higher energies than that, the photon that's coming in has so much energy that it's possible to go up here and basically to exceed the binding energy of the molecule. The light can give your electrons so much energy that it pops that electron straight off the molecule. If the electron is gone, and so here's your popping off of the electron, okay? if that electron is gone, you've ionized it. So you've heard of ionizing radiation, and this is x-rays. This is why you have to wear a lead vest when you get your x-rays taken at the dentist. They don't want to ionize your body or break bonds in your body. And it turns out you can do spectroscopy out there as well. But again, a topic for a different time. Okay, overwhelming diagram. Overwhelming diagram here is called Jablonski diagram. There's a few things to understand about this. The first thing is that instead of just saying E for electronic, electronic um, energy level, now things are marked with S and T. So what is S? S is a singlet state. And in a singlet state, you have paired electrons. So imagine you have two electrons. Um, you know, there's one up and one down. And that can be a singlet ground state, which is our S0. Or you could have a singlet excited state where your ground state electron and your excited state electron are still 
paired in terms of pointing in opposite directions of each other, but one's just in a higher energy level. Okay, so that's paired. The other option is to have a triplet state, which is your T. Okay. And those are only excited states. And in that case, both of the electrons are pointing in the same direction. For example, they're both spin up. Okay, important to know that. Now, what's going on here? There's things that you recognize. Um, for example, absorbance right here. We have going from that ground level of your ground S0 electronic state up to your excited singlet S1 state. What can happen next? Well, you'll notice all over the place here that we have a lot of little things that are labeled R. And they're little squiggly gray lines like that one. And like this one. And all of the other ones that you see as R. What is that? Well, many molecules, after they absorb light, relax, release that energy using vibrational relaxation. Vibrational relaxation does not emit any photons. So in this particular diagram, squiggly lines here means vibration. It doesn't mean a light photon. The straight lines on this diagram are photons. If this is the case, the light that's absorbed is released basically through heat. Heat is vibration. Alternatively, the molecules can relax back down by releasing the energy as light. And so that's those blue straight lines marked fluorescence and phosphorescence. All right, so there's your money right there. Fluorescence and phosphorescence, light emitted. How do they differ? How do they compare? Okay, here's a table. Absorbance and fluorescence are both singlet to singlet. Okay, so in that singlet ground state, you have the two electrons paired with each other. One of them stays there and the other one goes to an excited state, but their spin stays the same. Okay, absorbance and fluorescence, spin stays the same as singlet to singlet. Phosphorescence is this triplet state. And so the one electron that was spinned down in the excited state over here had to undergo something called inner system crossing. And that basically means that the spin flipped. And if it wants to go back down to the ground state, which is our singlet state here, that electron is going to have to flip spins back again because it's not allowed to have two pointing in the same direction. That's a big no-no. Okay. All right. So quantum mechanically, actually, you're not supposed to have these spin flipping, but hey, it happens because life isn't perfect. What does this ultimately mean? Well, because it's unlikely for the spin to flip, the phosphorescence is slow. It's rare to happen. It's also the least common. Fewer molecules are capable of doing this, whereas fluorescence is less common than absorbance. It takes a little bit more time than absorbance, but it's faster and more common than phosphorescence. Now, there will be other videos hanging in there um, that talk about sensitivity, but let it be known that the emission spectroscopies of fluorescence and phosphorescence are more sensitive than absorbance. All right, hang in there. We're halfway through. I know it's been 28 minutes, but this is such an incredibly important topic. All right, color. The color that is emitted by a light source, the color that you see with your eye, and the color that are absorbed are not necessarily the same. This is a wildly colorful graphic here. The background of the spectrum is the color of the light emitted by the light source, and so it corresponds to the wavelength on the bottom. The lines are the spectra of food dyes. And so the blue line here is the spectrum for a blue food dye solution. So as we look at this, the blue dye appears blue because it absorbs red. So here's our blue dye and its main absorbance here is of red light. It reflects the blue light, doesn't absorb it very much. Here's our really low absorbance down here of blue light. So blue dye looks blue because it doesn't absorb blue light. It reflects the blue light. This is going to be the same for all of them. Our red dye up here is going to mostly absorb blue-green light. It reflects the red, doesn't absorb red. Yellow solutions absorb violet light, not absorbing yellow. 
And of course, if you had green, it's a combination of blue and yellow. Um, I think that's really cool that you can see that in the spectrum. So here's the contribution from the yellow part of the green dye, and here's the contribution from the blue part of the green dye. If we look at the color wheel and complementary colors, now you've got a nice little table here with some nanometers. You can see this again. Um, if you have red light that's absorbed right here, okay, then the color that you observe of the actual sample is blue-green. And you can use these opposite color wheel things um, to be like, okay, well, if it absorbs in red, if I go across the color wheel, it's gonna look green. So you have these complementary colors. Okay, the instrument itself. This is called a block diagram where you have little boxes for each component. You have to have the light source. We haven't talked a lot about it, but you need a wavelength selector, things like monochromators or filters. Then you have a sample, then a detector, and then something to record the data. The sample for molecular absorbance is usually held in a cuvette, which is on a square or cylindrical transparent device. And you have light that's going in, and then that's coming in from the left here, of course. And so light in, and then less of it comes out the other side because your sample absorbed some. So what's actually measured in absorbance spectroscopy is something called transmittance or transmission. And that's a ratio of how much light came out versus how much light went in. Okay, so sometimes it's abbreviated with an I for irradiance, other times it's abbreviated with a P for power. The main components there, forgive me for the kind of overwhelming table, we have the lamp. These can differ a little bit based on what type of the spectrum you're using. So UV versus visible. Where they differ is in the lamp and in the cuvette material. For UV, you need to use a deuterium arc lamp, whereas visible, you can use a tungsten lamp, like an old fashioned light bulb. For your cuvette, if you want to use the UV, you really need a quartz cuvette or there are some UV transparent plastics that are available. The quartz is the top of the line. Visible, it's okay to use glass, but you really cannot use glass for UV. It'll absorb that UV light. Both types of the UV and vis can use a filter or a monochromator to pick the wavelength, and both of them will use photomultiplier tubes as detectors. There's gonna be a separate presentation that tells you more about all these components. For fluorescence, our block diagram is a little bit different. We're still starting with a light source. And so position one is light source. And then if you move to the right here, ignore the bottom for a moment, you have the filter slash monochromator. And then step three is your sample. But now note that there's a 90 degree angle. If you were over here with your beautiful little blue eye watching, you would be blinded by the light source and you wouldn't be able to see the light that's emitted by the sample. So monitoring there is going to give you absorbance. It's not going to let you see the emission. So 90 degree angle allows you to not see as much of the detector. And now you can have, or not see as much of the original light. And now you can place your detector down at the 90 degree angle. So what we're used to is seeing right here, the detector as next, but Fluorescence also has an additional monochromator, so you can select what wavelength of light was emitted prior to the detector. Some instruments will also have a second detector off on the side, that's this one, and it's there to basically monitor how bright the light source was. On the right-hand side here, you see a picture of one of the luminescence spectrometers that we have, and your sample is actually at this 90 degree angle, so your cuvette will go right in here. There's the top of your cuvette square, and you've got light going in 90 degrees in and out. All right, you've probably heard of Beer's Law. Now I'm gonna walk you into how we got Beer's Law. The starting point for quantifying with spectroscopy, getting real numbers of concentration, has to do with the fact that again, the molecule absorbs light if the energy of a photon equals the change in energy between the homo and lumo. We make the assumption 
that all identical molecules will have the same chance of absorbing a photon. So if you're benzene and I'm benzene and we both get 300 photons, we're gonna absorb the same quantity of them. That chance of absorbing the photon has a bunch of different names. Um, Spectroscopy is used a lot and hey, different names is just what it's played with. Sometimes it's called absorption coefficient, other times absorptivity because it extinguishes the light. It's also called the extinction coefficient and the symbols are just as abundant. Um, you can get a normal A, you can get an alpha, those are both obviously related to absorption, and then epsilon, which seems to represent E for extinction to me. So I mentioned a moment ago that what you're actually measuring is transmission. So how does transmission relate to concentration? Great question. I'm glad you asked. If we have a plot here and it's blank on the bottom right, we've got percent transmission, y-axis versus concentration. What we know intuitively is that the more molecules you have, the less light that's going to make it through. So we expect a downward trend in light transmitted as concentration increases. But what kind of downward trend? Well, let's figure it out. Here is a cuvette full of a blank solution. If you take that, that should be 100% transmission. So there's our first data point. Now what we want to do is draw on here molecules. So what happens if you have four molecules? Okay. Well, let's just say arbitrarily that these four molecules can absorb 50% of the light. And so if you have 100 photons going in, 50 of them make it out. And there's our next data point. All right, let's take this again and let's double the concentration. Yeah. Doubling the concentration, what you can do is effectively split that cuvette. It's the same overall distance, but think about it this way. The first four molecules encountered on this left-hand side, when you first have the photons hitting, you've got that 100%. By halfway through, you've ended up making the same amount of light absorbed in half the solution as you did before. All right, so it's 50% absorbed by the time you get there. Now your next four molecules are going to, hey, four molecules absorb 50% of the light, but they only got 50 photons. Oh no, okay. Well, if they're absorbing 50% of 50, then by the time it comes out, you guessed it, you have 25 photons, and that's indeed what's observed. Now we'll take that one step further, just make sure you've got the idea. We double again, right? So we've got another, we don't double again, we get another four units of concentration, and our first four molecules are going to take the 100 to the 70 or to the 50 and then the next four molecules are going to take 50 percent of 50 and that gets us down to 25 and then the next four molecules and they don't have to all be in line like this is going to take us 50 percent of this 25 and by the time it gets through all of the solution you have 12 and a half and alas you end up taking 100 photons to 12 and a half and now if you look at this trend, what we see is a decreasing, as we expected, exponential curve. And so transmission decreases exponentially as the concentration increases. And you can describe that here, T equals 10 to the power of minus, there's your decrease, K, just a constant, times concentration, C. All right, Beer's Law. Here's the thing. Absorbance is convenient. So what is absorbance? Absorbance is a thing defined on the basis of convenience. So let's talk about what's inconvenient about transmission. Transmission decreases exponentially as concentration increases. Here's the rub. People, a person, people like positive linear trends. So what we're going to do is create a positive linear trend on the right hand side where concentration exists. So focus yourself on this side that has concentration. First things first, get rid of the exponent. If you take the log of both sides, you'll have log of t on the left, log of 10 to the power of, removes the power. And so you get minus kc. Next, get rid of the negative. Okay, So multiply both sides by a negative one. Right? Now the right hand side which had a negative, well times a negative one, that becomes positive. Oh, perfect. We have now created a positive linear thing on the right hand side where concentration lives. Insert 
the magic of it all. You take that negative log of t and you just rename it. You call it absorbance. So here's your definition. Absorbance equals the negative log of t transmission. Why do we do this? We don't like negative trends. So negative negates the negative. We don't like exponential trends. Log negates that. Cool. All right. So if you make that substitution of a equals negative log t right here, then we end up having absorbance equals some constant k times concentration. Perfect. Word to the wise, t, remember, is a fraction of the light that's transmitted over the incident light. Do not use percent transmittance here. So that number should be less than one. Okay. If it's 100 or 50, um, like the example I did before was percent transmittance for concept, don't do percent transmittance. has to be transmittance as a fraction. Okay, Beer's Law. We take the k of a constant here, and we figure out that that constant has to do with, oh yeah, remember how much a molecule absorbs, absorptivity? And hey, how much do you actually have? If you have more like length of solution, you'll get more absorbance. So Beer's Law is absorbance equals epsilon, which is absorptivity, times path length times concentration. Awesome. Now, next thing here. If we take the spectrum of a molecule, spectrum again, absorbance versus wavelength, we know that this spectrum is all isoprene, but it has different absorbances. So if this pure compound absorbs differently at different wavelengths, epsilon must depend on wavelength. And so a more proper version of Beer's law is that the absorbance at a given wavelength, lambda, is going to equal the epsilon at that wavelength times the path length of the cubet times C for concentration. What wavelength should I choose, Dr. Gosher? Well, great question. We use the wavelength max. Um, that is the wavelength right here in our green box. So that is the wavelength where you have maximum absorbance. So on this one, we kind of dot our way down and we see that it's 510. All right. So wavelength at maximum absorbance equals 510. Why do we use that? Well, there's multiple good reasons, but one good reason is if you get more signal absorbance, you can go to lower concentrations. Cool. Um, the other thing is that the peaks up there, it's nice and broad and flat. And so we do have this thing in the instrument, the monochrometer or the filter that picks that wavelength. And if the wavelength chosen drifts a little bit, it changes. Um, if it goes from the left side of that window to the right side, absorbance there stays pretty flat. Um, but if you're off on the shoulder here and it goes from the left side to the right side of this little wavelength range, absorbance changed a lot, which is not good for you. And that deviation um, will really matter as concentration changes as well. And so you'll get kind of a crappy linearity if you're not on the peak. Um, and that's shown on the right-hand side there. Beer's Law. Is it perfect? Hell no. It has some limitations. There's three limitations. The first one is that Beer's Law assumes a dilute analyte. Dilute here is usually less than 0 0.01 molar. Why? Um, there's a lot of reasons. Some of this has to do with fundamentals of energy levels. If you have a high concentration, the analyte becomes part of the matrix. One analyte molecule, me, is surrounded by other ones, you, and you influence my energy levels. And if you're influencing my energy level, you're influencing the wavelength um, and all sorts of things. Maybe also the viscosity or the refractive index can change with concentration. Also, with instrumentation, if you have a really high concentration and really high absorbance, you don't get enough light transmitted through. And so any stray photons from the room that don't make it through the nice black box that we have encasing this instrument become a problem. All right, more limitations. There are two more. Um, so of course, low concentration. And the other two are that the analyte shouldn't be involved in a concentration-dependent equilibrium. This happens with weak acid and base chemistry. Um, you have an analyte that can have two forms. Um, so a weak acid, HA, can be HA together, or it can be A minus where it's lost that proton. 
if it becomes less dissociated and a more concentrated solution, then you're going to have a change in absorbance. So that's no good. And then the final thing is that Beer's law is really only true and valid if you have monochromatic radiation. This, again, is an instrumental aspect, and it has to do with the fact that the observativity differs at the different wavelengths. Um, and we try to get around this, like I mentioned previously, by measuring on top of the absorbance peak. So if your wavelength changes a little bit, the change in absorbance isn't that much. So what's a good absorbance? The answer to this is that it really depends on the instrument. But a good rule of thumb is that an absorbance of 0.3 to 2.0 has the least error. In between those are good absorbances. Well, I know that you thirst for knowledge, so you probably are wondering why. Well, we can answer that with just a quick bit of math. Absorbance, as we know, is negative log of t. t is 10 to the negative a. So in the case that we have too much light transmitted, picture yourself staring into a light bulb and figuring out how much of the light was dimmed. It's kind of difficult to do for you, and it's difficult for detectors as well. And so what we'll say here on the too much light end is that we have um, a percent transmittance of 50%. And of course, we know that we can't use percents. We have to use T. And so T as a fraction is 0 0.5. Okay. Well, absorbance is negative log of t, so negative log of 0.5, and that's going to equal 0 0.3. So that's where that comes from. If you have too little light transmitted, think about how much on the low end you could measure. And so maybe percent t is like, well, I could still probably measure 1% of the total light. Like that's enough to give a signal as the detector. And so that means a t of 0 0.01, putting that 1% into a fraction. And then we plug that in, A equals negative log of T. And hey, guess what that comes out? Two. So this is the reasoning behind the range of too much light, you can't tell if anything changed, versus too little light, you still need to have something to work with. Well, you're really good with questions, I gotta say. What if my analyte isn't the only thing absorbing? Guess what? It never is the only thing absorbing. You have a cuvette, you have solution. A bunch of things will cause decrease in light transmitted. The cuvette itself is going to reflect and scatter light. You have all of these interfaces where the light can reflect off of the surface of the cuvette on the inside or the outside of the glass. Um, particles and bubbles, and bubbles are bad, you really don't want bubbles, can scatter light. Um, the solvent itself might absorb, and you might have other components of your matrix, matrix being anything in your sample other than the analyte. Those things could also absorb. So what do we do? Um, you need a reagent blank. This is a solution that contains everything but your analyte, and you have to measure that subtract. Well, okay. Does Beer's Law work with more than one analyte? Of course it does. Yes. Beer's Law is additive. Suppose you have three analytes numbered one through three and they all absorb at the same wavelength, lambda. Then the absorbance in total at that particular wavelength is going to basically be on the right-hand side, Beer's Law for each individual one. And so for epsilon, for analyte one at that wavelength, and the concentration of analyte one. And then you can go on, and you can see that you have epsilon for analyte two and concentration of analyte two, and then you also have epsilon and concentration for analyte three. And this can go on. You can do plus dot, dot, dot as much as you want. And that's true for as many analytes as you have. So what do you do if the spectra overlap and you want to purify them? Um, you've got this mixture in blue and it has these two things that are so close, so similar. Um, briefly, the concept here is that you have to have two standard solutions for these two analytes or you know the concentration. And so you get these reference spectra, the dotted and dashed lines here, and that allows you to calculate the epsilon, the molar absorptivity coefficient, for each wavelength. And then what you can do is try to reconstruct that mixed spectrum. You use something called least squares fitting, and you're basically scaling up and down the concentrations of, in this case, titanium and vanadium, until what you're doing by adding, you know, 0.5 of the vanadium spectrum and the plus 0.6 of the titanium, you edit those things until it matches the mixture. 
If you have less overlap than this, maybe there's a characteristic wavelength, and so that could be something like um, this one's like that, and that one's like this, and they overlap a little bit, but you could choose this wavelength right here, which is mostly that one, and that wavelength right there that's mostly that one. And then you're able to go ahead and have these two equations of two unknowns, and you're basically using the additive Beer's law equation on the previous slide. If you need to do this, it's definitely worth seeking out additional help. All right, we're getting down to the end now. The final ultimate thing you want to do a good spectroscopy experiment. What are the things you need to look out for? The first one is that blank. You need a solution that contains everything but the analyte. And you need to put that blank either in the exact same cuvette that you use for the analyte or in a matched cuvette. So you have the same path length and the same scattering and reflectance and all of that. You have to make sure you subtract this blank reading or the baseline spectrum. And if you're making a calibration curve, the intercept of that calibration curve should be zero if you have a good blank. The next thing is to keep your cuvettes clean. Um, real fun fact, fingerprints can absorb light, scatter, and fluoresce, which is just perfect. Um, so use gloves, use um, Kim wipes, clean that cuvette off. Um, you don't want to scratch the surface of the cuvette, so make sure that you're being gentle. But also, you have to pay attention to the direction that the light goes in your instrument. Is it left to right, front to back? Particularly if your cuvette has frosted sides and clear sides. Do you want the light going through the clear sides? The next keys to doing a basic spectroscopy experiment well are to make sure you're using the correct wavelength. You can determine the wavelength max by looking it up in the literature, or you can take pure analyte and scan a spectrum and figure out where the highest absorbance is. But beware that not all spectrometers are able to scan, so make sure you're using the right one. Then if you're trying to quantify, you have to make sure you have the epsilon at that maximum wavelength. This is based on the absorbance of the samples of known concentration. And you just go ahead and you use Beer's law. A equals epsilon path length and concentration. If you know that known concentration and you measure absorbance, also your path length is known because it's probably published on the cubet that you're using. Now you're able to calculate and solve for epsilon. And then the final thing that I would warn you to do is to make sure that Beer's law is valid. This is done by making a calibration curve for your concentration range. Beer's law is only true for the concentration range that rises linearly. So if you have a calibration curve of concentration and absorbance, it should look nice and linear, okay? And the slope here is epsilon L, right? Because A is your y-axis and C is your x-axis. Do not extrapolate past the range of the measured curve. So if you measure from here to here, you have a sample out here, you can't use that curve. You have to measure out there. Also, maybe you're not so linear. Maybe it's curving like that. Well, then you have to figure out what the linear range of that is. If it's curved, if it's not linear, it's not following Beer's law. Beer's law states that it's linear. All right, I hope you found this helpful, even though it's a little bit long, but I guess it's about the same as a lecture in a classroom. Peace out, absorb the light, and don't forget to emit once in a while.